New Zealand, an island nation isolated from the rest of the world by thousands of kilometres of open ocean. Landscapes forged by titanic forces, peaks carved by fire and ice, rugged coastlines and primeval forests. Over millions of years, these islands and neighbouring Australia became extraordinary evolutionary laboratories. Bizarre species found nowhere else on Earth emerged and thrived. About 70 metres at the bottom. We're still unlocking the mysteries of New Zealand's oceans. Marine fossils give us clues. When I look at it, I think, this was once living. There are survivors too, creatures that met every challenge thrown at them. The environment they live in can change in seconds. Half of that mountain has slipped away. Massive earthquakes can batter the country. Where our feet are used to be at the same level as where my hand is now. A tsunami, shockwaves going through the ocean, mudslides flowing down into the depths. How have New Zealand's marine animals adapted to their unpredictable world? There's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Kaikoura is located on the east coast of New Zealand's South Island. Massive geological upheaval has created this landscape. Because New Zealand sits in the collision zone between the Australian and Pacific geological plates, earthquakes occur frequently. Every rise on the shoreline is the consequence of an earthquake uplifting the land. Beneath the ocean, earthquakes have also had a huge impact, creating a gigantic trench, the Kaikoura Canyon. 60 kilometers long and up to 1,200 meters deep, the canyon leads to a channel that meanders for hundreds of kilometres, splitting the ocean floor. Today, it's one of the richest seabeds in the world and a wildlife haven. Marine ecologist Sharon Goldstein and geologist Julian Thompson regularly visit Kaikoura to check how seismic activity is affecting wildlife. By monitoring fluctuations in animal populations, scientists can gauge the health of an entire ecosystem. The team sets off in search of the canyon's most famous resident. Sperm whales are the world's largest toothed predator. Their primary food source is deep-sea squid. Finding whales is a specialist job. Roger Williams from local company Whale Watch uses a hydrophone, a directional microphone with a conical dish to focus sound. Kaikoura is one of the few locations where sperm whales live year-round. If Roger finds one quickly, it's an encouraging sign all is well with the wider population. Hey, Mike. He's clicking away nicely. Toothed whales use sound to hunt prey. 
emitting loud clicks that bounce back from anything they hit. He's about half a mile to the northwest. If the clicks stop, it indicates the whale has stopped hunting and is about to surface for air. This is really exciting. We are above a thousand meters of water with the most majestic animal beside us. And they stay above the canyon where there's good feeding. Absolutely amazing to see him just breathing here on the surface, taking some time before his next dive. Sperm whales dive for up to 90 minutes, longer than almost any other marine mammal. They hunt at depths of up to 3,000 metres. At Kaikoura, sperm whales are apex predators in the food chain. If the whale population is thriving, the surrounding marine environment is likely to be healthy. Is he going to help me with that? I think I can reach out there. <laughs> the basis of the rich food chain here is plankton small creatures carried along by the ocean's current. We're going to do a plankton tow. So we'll just attach the net to the boat. We're going to capture the microscopic organisms that are in that surface water. So if they're not here, then the rest of the food chain collapses right up to the large whales that are so unique around this area. Plankton range from microscopic organisms to shrimps and jellyfish. The tiny plankton are eaten by animals such as crabs and fish, which in turn are eaten by squid, the sperm whale's food. This is a fantastic sample we've got here. It's full of life. The food chain looks like it's in good health. So if this stuff's in good condition, then we can see why the, the larger animals are also in, in good condition and doing well. It's a really nice wee sample. Movement of the Earth's geological plates doesn't just create ocean trenches, it also forces rock upwards. What we can see in the distance over there are the Kaikoura Ranges. And these mountains have been uplifted over the last several million years, one earthquake at a time. Follow the peaks south from Kaikoura and you reach Fiordland. Scientists here are exploring a very different marine environment. The dramatic landscape of Fiordland was carved by glaciers. When the ice receded some 12,000 years ago, the ocean flooded these glacial valleys to create deep fjords. The most famous of these, Milford Sound, has been described as the eighth wonder of the world. New life forms and marine species are still being discovered in these waters. Working here can be challenging. Fiordland is one of the wettest places in the world. Can't have a rainforest without rain. Rainfall can be 250 millimetres a day, over seven metres a year. But you can see at the moment where that cursor is, we're in nearly 300 metres of water there. Parts of Milford Sound are over 400 metres deep. Most of it is unexplored. <laughs> Captain Rob Swale and ecologist Sean Hadley are leading a marine survey team. 
It's important work. By understanding the species living here, strategies can be developed to best protect them and the environment. In the back section, uh, this is all electronics, a few fans. But uh, tether will take us to a thousand meters. The only thing that runs through this is fiber optics. First in are the surface divers on a mission to find a prehistoric shark. Marine cameraman Steve Hathaway is leading the dive team. Conditions are less than ideal. This is field one for you though, isn't it? It's just a lot of rain and the water looks absolutely disgusting on the surface here, but we're expecting it to really open up by the time we go down to about four metres. The surface water is clouded by a natural dye called tannin, found in the dense rainforest vegetation. Rainwater runoff collects tannins from plants and soil, staining fresh water the colour of tea. In the ocean, it sits in a layer, blocking much of the sunlight. When you're down a little bit deeper and you look up, you've lost some of the colours from the colour spectrum. The first colour is going to disappear as red, then orange, and it's making everything look quite green under there. The lack of light makes plants and animals think they're deeper than they really are. It's a unique environment, home to species usually found living at much greater depths. Water flooding off the mountains of Milford Sound constantly changes the underwater environment. With so much recent rain, the water is particularly murky. We're still discovering what lives in this unique habitat, but the divers have been warned large sharks are present. As they explore, they discover a large outcrop of black coral. The coral is actually white when alive, only becoming black when it dies. Elsewhere, it's unheard of at depths less than 35 metres. A single colony of black coral might live around 4,000 years, one of the oldest continuously living organisms on the planet. In this cold, dark environment, hundreds of species create a kaleidoscope of colour on the rocks. Many are only found in New Zealand. Sea anemones look beautiful, but their tentacles are lethal. Triggered by the slightest touch, they fire a harpoon to paralyze passing fish. The tentacles then guide the victim into the anemone's mouth. Tube-like animals called sea cucumbers lounge on the rocks. They're relatives of starfish and are first seen in the fossil record some 400 million years ago. Like earthworms on land, they feed on tiny particles, breaking them down into even smaller particles for bacteria to feed on. Not all the wildlife is so benign. Deep below is a seven-gilled shark, a species known to attack divers. For me, one of the stars of the show down here is seven gilled sharks. They're very prehistoric looking. And I think one of their tactics for catching food is using ambush. They'd actually sneak up on us and all of a sudden they'd come from behind you and just shoot past. Most sharks have five gills. However, as its name suggests, this ancient species has seven. 
They evolved 145 to 200 million years ago and today remain virtually unchanged from their ancient relatives. They grow up to three meters in length and commonly feed on seals and dolphins. Divers need to be wary of them. Seven gill sharks are stealthy hunters. Making very little movement until dashing into strike. Researchers believe seven gills undertake long distance migrations to breeding grounds in the open ocean. Above water, weather conditions are rapidly deteriorating. Because the research vessel can't get close to the rocks, a small boat has been launched. It's now up to Paul, the dive supervisor, to guide the divers in. OK, so it's too windy here at the moment. We've got 40 knots plus. We're going to transfer them back onto the boat further down to yours. A lot of the time it can be calm when you put them in and then within 10, 15 minutes, you know, you, all of a sudden you can have 50, 60 knots. It's just one of those places that can change very, very quickly. Those sharks are definitely very stealthy. The one time I turn around, I'm filming the surface, and turn around, there's two right behind me. How's that? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Your first seven gill sharks, yeah, eh? incredible. A lot of people get quite relaxed around them and probably yeah. too relaxed when you've got an animal that is known to pack attack seals. Yeah. If you yeah. can catch a seal in the water, you're a very, very capable animal. With the divers safely back on board, remote operated cameras can be lowered. The fjord is 400 metres deep. Nobody knows what they'll discover. So you can see here, we're right even against this wall here, we're in 300 metres. And, you know, obviously none of this has ever been explored before. feeds to a viewing room. That's 240 there. Mm -hmm. 270 metres and we've hit the bottom. Mm -hmm. Wow. There's a lot of fish down there, considering 200 and what 75 metres there. Oh, these are very deep water species. Oh, look at that! Oh, look at that! It'd be interesting with that dark water layer. What would be the equivalent in a normal ocean, whether that's 800 metres deep or something? Like these species are living a lot shallower than normal. These fish are rat tails, a species that existed alongside the dinosaurs. Rat tails are usually found at depths of over 4,000 metres. Here, they live at 200. Like many deep sea fish, their large eyes are very sensitive. Rat tails have chemical receptors on their head and lips, which are used to locate food. They aren't fussy eaters and are happy to feed on anything from worms to carrion. Hagfish, I think. Hagfish are as ancient as rat tails. They're another living fossil. So these guys have a defensive mechanism. When something grabs them, they produce a lot of mucus. But they're completely blind and they've got really good smell. Amazingly, they're the only living creature with a skull but no backbone. Very little is known about many of New Zealand's deep sea creatures, which makes surveys like this all the more important. 
With the boundaries of deep sea exploration being pushed ever further, it's likely new species will be discovered. As the ROV returns to the surface, an inquisitive seven-gilled shark comes in to investigate. At the same time these sharks shared the ocean with dinosaurs, another voracious predator roamed the marine world. In New Zealand, only fossils of this creature exist today. But in Australia, a population still lives in the warm environment. Here, the waters are tropical, just as they were in New Zealand before the country started slowly drifting south. Northern Australia is known as the Top End. A vast area of marshes and muddy estuaries. And renowned for its massive saltwater crocodiles. It's also home to a giant prehistoric fish. It's easy to see why this strange-looking creature is named the sawfish. Once it was common, but its distinctive snout has long been a popular trophy for hunters. It's now one of the rarest fish in the world. The Northern Territory Wildlife Park is home to captive sawfish. Marine biologists hope their research here will assist efforts to save this critically endangered species from extinction. Shale Martin manages the facility for the Parks and Wildlife Commission. So sawfish are really fascinating. They're a draw card species to our aquarium. Because of their size and their unique features, sawfish are also amazing from an evolutionary perspective. They're roughly halfway between a ray and a shark. Like sharks, skates and rays, sawfish have a skeleton made of cartilage. It's lightweight but strong, allowing these fish to grow very large. The sawfish snout looks as if it's armed with teeth. In fact, the teeth are sharp scales. When it detects prey, the sawfish attacks and kills by thrashing its jagged snout from side to side. This sawfish is now almost three metres long and will double in length as it matures. But even larger sawfish once lived in New Zealand. The fossil record reveals that Onchopristus, a giant sawfish, grew up to eight metres long. They lived between 145 and 65 million years ago. Their eventual decline led to the evolution of today's marine giants. For well over 100 million years, giant marine reptiles like the plesiosaur dominated the world's oceans. 10 metres long and snake-necked, they were formidable predators. Until a catastrophic event occurred, instantly changing the course of evolution. 65 million years ago, a 10 kilometre wide asteroid struck Earth.
The resulting climate change event contributed to the mass extinction of dinosaurs. New environments and habitats became available and new species emerged. One such group was whales. To discover more about the evolution of New Zealand's whales, you head away from the sea to remote mountain valleys. The Waitaki region of the South Island is a world-renowned fossil hunting location. Twenty-five million years ago, this area looked very different. Most of New Zealand had sunk beneath the ocean. Only a few small islands remained above the waves. Today we see what was once the floor of a tropical ocean. The evidence is limestone cliffs. Limestone is formed from the remains of shells and other marine organisms. Look at this, guys. We have these prominent shell beds. Each one marks the old sea floor. They're stacked up one on top of the other. This rock was formed far from land. If you scrape a little bit off like this, tiny little grains of sand. The father of geological research in New Zealand, Alexander Mackay, first discovered this site in 1880. The rock contains immaculate ancient whale fossils. Professor Ewan Fordyce from New Zealand's University of Otago has been studying these fossils for over 30 years, gathering clues to throw fresh light on whale evolution. When marine animals die, they fall to the sea floor, where they are scavenged and disappear. This is, this is the mother line. Oh. But on occasion, some are buried beneath the surface, eventually turning to stone. Bit of shell bed there, guys. Aha, uh -huh. this, this is what we really want. It looks like bone. Actually, there's some there and here. I'll bet these are jaw bones, actually. It's got the characteristic oval shape and it looks like the other jaw bone is right next to it. So this is what we want. So how much rock are we going to have to take off? Half a cubic metre, not much. Unlike most limestone, the bedrock in South Canterbury wasn't buried deep in the ground and compressed. It's so soft that Ewan has developed a rapid method of excavation. Cutting into the rock with a chainsaw. To make sure he doesn't damage it, Ewan leaves plenty of room around the fossil. Very occasionally, entire skeletons are found. But on this occasion, as the rock is cut away, only small pieces of skull are revealed. Yeah, that looks good. We can see bits of bone there, yep. here, up there. That's great. The fossil tells a story. We know that modern whales, when they die, blow up with gas a bit and bob around in the water and they are gradually scavenged by sharks and the like. But if they're bobbing around for long enough and decomposing, bits of them fall off onto the bottom while the rest of the body drifts away elsewhere. And that's my guess with this specimen. An old car bonnet makes a perfect sledge to drag the heavy rock onto the trailer. Whoa, stop! 
After 25 million years, the whale skull departs on another journey. Ewan's laboratory is testament to a lifetime of research. Hi, Sophie. Let's have a look at that ear bone that you've turned up. My favourite bone. There was one bone that we could get from a fossil whale to actually say what the species is and how it lived and how big it was, and this is it and it's species specific. This air bone's from a type of whale called Tokarahia, and there are several species. One of them lived around 26 million years. At the time when New Zealand was largely flooded and underwater, about getting onto halfway back to the age of the dinosaurs. The university cellars are a fossil storeroom, allowing us to travel millions of years back in time. The very earliest whales were toothed whales, and they would eat hard prey, fish, penguins, and the like. This animal in front of us is actually a baleen whale. It didn't really have any significant teeth in life, and it would have taken mouthfuls of water and taken food from the water. It ate little prey like krill, for example. And it was a very successful lifestyle, helped the whales to get big in terms of their evolutionary history. The biggest animals eating the littlest food. This whale lived around 25 million years ago. New Zealand's oceans were teeming with life at that time. It was a perfect environment for giant predators. The most efficient and fearsome of them all was a giant shark. This is a megalodon tooth. This tooth from one of the bigger megalodons ever recorded is from New Zealand. It's not a world record breaker, but it's pretty close. We know that these animals got to perhaps 20 metres long. That's based on the size of teeth and vertebrae. And a 20 metre long megalodon would weigh about 100 tonnes. So that is just absolutely monstrous compared to a modern great white shark. Megalodons weighed in at least 10 times heavier than today's great white shark. They were arguably the most efficient predator to ever swim in the oceans. But around 2 million years ago, they disappeared. One theory suggests a new marine predator evolved, a gigantic dolphin still living today. Orca grow to almost 10 metres and can weigh up to 10 tonnes. Because of their size, they are sometimes known as killer whales. They have conical-shaped teeth to catch fast-moving prey. They also have extremely efficient hearing. Yet their greatest asset may be cooperation. Orca are extremely intelligent and have learned to herd their prey together by hunting as a pack. Orca's ancestors may have competed with Megalodon for prey and their success seems to have contributed to the decline of the megalodon. The extinction of megalodon may have allowed whales to evolve to become even larger than their ancestors. Today, New Zealand is a haven for whales, but they still face challenges. The Kaikoura Marine Reserve is renowned for its resident sperm whales. Unfortunately, the region has just been hit by a life-changing event, and nobody knows how it will have affected the whales.
A recent earthquake in New Zealand's Kaikoura region rated 7.8 magnitude. A powerful earthquake by world standards. Many roads in the area were closed due to landslips. Marine ecologist Sharon Goldstein and geologist Julian Thompson are here to check how the event has impacted the wildlife. With them is specialist technician Justin Harrison. It's immediately apparent the tide line has moved a significant distance. So somewhere here is the present high tide mark, is that right? So the high tide used to go way up to the car park and all of this would be underwater. As the coastline was uplifted, meters of water was being shed off these upraised areas. According to the locals on land, that was an incredibly loud waterfall of sound. When the ocean floor uplifted, many creatures were stranded. Sharon and Mike Morrissey from the Department of Conservation have come to check on a nearby seal colony. The impact of such a powerful earthquake is bound to have caused massive change. The geologists are here to measure the uplift. That's a great sight to see. They're up pups. Yeah. And they're playing. Yeah, after all that's happened, they look really good, don't they? They look healthy. We can see at least 10 just in this little area. There's a lot more pups here than usual. Why do you think that is? I think it's probably because of the earthquakes and they've gone away from the places where they were normally pupping. It's hard to say until we look at those other areas, but we'll have a good idea then. Yeah. OK, how's that looking? And that's about 80 centimetres. OK. 80 centimetres of uplift in this area means that the whole peninsula came up by that amount. So this whole region has been shifted in a few seconds of time. It's a massive event. There are a number of seal colonies on the coast and Sharon fears some have been severely impacted. Further north of Kaikoura, we have the largest breeding area for the New Zealand fur seal, and they've had a harder time in the earthquake. Not only did they have the shaking and the uplift, but we also know there are very large landslides right on their colony area. As you go northward from the point where this earthquake originated, you see actually a greater and greater impact there are several large faults, and in these areas, that's where the uplift has been most pronounced. Some of these faults are quite stark, quite dramatic gashes, almost like a, a knife has cut through the landscape uh, in quite an extraordinary and uh, exceptional way. We're just flying over where the fault cuts across the road and the railway. And you can see how the road has been displaced sideways as well as the railway. This earthquake produced about 100,000 landslides. Yeah, Sharon, that's the seal colony down there that, that you've been studying. Yep, if we just turn around from here at any point. 
The seal colony has been hit by a huge rockfall and there's nowhere the helicopter can land. Yeah, make sure we get those rocks over there. A thermal imaging camera is used to assess how many seals remain. There's some lighted areas up here now. You're yeah. picking them ones up back there? Yeah, we're picking up a few rocks actually. A few rocks here. There's quite a lot of pups up here. It's good news, but it looks as if many seals have left and moved to other colonies. Their survey mission continues northward. How's this rock here? Is that all right? They land in a small area where the uplift seems particularly dramatic. It's hard to believe that that didn't exist before the earthquake. That is the fault going through there, one of many of these faults that have crisscrossed this area. Well, the whole area has actually been uplifted, and the far side of the fault has uplifted even more. Should we go and have a look? Either way. It's not often that a geologist can see a new feature in the landscape just appear before their eyes like this. It's just extraordinary to be here, actually. Wow, it's so amazing to see this. Um, so where our feet are used to be at the same level as where my hand is now. So that's, what do you think? Two metres. About two metres. Two metres of uplift. But don't forget, it's a fracture in the earth going right down probably 10, 15 kilometres into the crust. And all of that rock has moved on one side relative to the other. The rupture across here would have just happened in seconds. And the ripping apart of those rocks is what created the powerful shaking of this earthquake. As the coastline was uplifted, meters of water was being shed off these upraised areas. That's devastating. So the low tide level would have been here somewhere and all of this below the water. Yeah, well. This seaweed is subtitle that should be underwater. According to the locals on land, that was an incredibly loud waterfall of sound. True subtitle, none of this would ever have come out of the water. Many creatures were close to the rocks or hidden in the rocks, were just uh, stranded out of the water and died. Already we can see the power shells, see yeah. that. They see it and it's just sitting waiting for the tide to come back in. Which it never will. Not up here. This is a, it's like a moonscape. Lots of devastation, but the water and the new intertidal zone is out there. The organisms, we have to remember, will recover. It's not the end of them. <laughs> I'll just start in a new place. There'll be a big shift. This area is a dramatic reminder that New Zealand's geology is incredibly unstable. Yet its animals are able to adapt to massive change that sometimes happens in just seconds. There's another question to answer. Whales are very sensitive to vibrations. Has the earthquake driven them away from Kaikoura? I was in Kaikoura for the recent earthquake and on land it was loud and there was a very violent shaking. The vibrations under the water 
are felt much more. So it would have come from all around them and it probably would have been quite scary. What depth are we at, Mike? Uh, a thousand, just on a thousand metres. OK, I'll have a listen over here. Roger Williams has joined them again. If the whales are still around, he's the man to find them. Incredible. Do you know who this guy is? Yeah, he's a whale that we've been uh, seeing feeding off our coastline now for about um, 20 years plus. Kaikoura is a very special place. It is unique, and just the young males that are resident here, most likely because the canyon is so close to shore and there is so much food here for them, why would they go anywhere else? Seismic events are common in New Zealand. The forces that isolated it continue to shape the country and its wildlife today. In another 100 million years, New Zealand will look very different. Earthquakes will continue to shape the landscape. Parts of New Zealand may again sink beneath the waves. Some species will adapt. Others may disappear and become part of the fossil record. One thing is certain. Whatever the changes, New Zealand is likely to remain home to some of the most unique animals on Earth. Mm.